A wave of heat washed up through her cockpit and drenched her in a layer of sweat, but the Battlemaster's double-strength heat sinks quickly pulled the waste heat away. The penetrator retreated behind the cover of the dune, only to be quickly replaced by another mech. The enemy Cerberus leveled both arms at Evelina's mech and fired. Two nickel-iron slugs flashed from the Goss rifle barrels and crossed the distance to her in a blink of an eye. It felt like her stomach sank to her feet as the Battlemaster heaved up and back. Her teeth rattled as the mech slammed back into the sand and slid down the hill. When the clans smashed into the forces of the Inner Sphere in 3049, it seemed as though they had every advantage. The mech components were lighter, the weapons fired farther, and often had lower mass and volume. It's no wonder that the first few years of the conflict were extremely painful for the warriors of the Inner Sphere and extremely concerning for the great houses that thought themselves masters of all the universe. One saving grace was the rediscovery of technology required to build Gauss rifles, thanks to the Hell Memory Core information dump. Though the clans had retained their Gauss rifle technology, it hadn't advanced leaps and bounds like the energy weapons, missiles, and other ballistics. The power of the Inner Sphere Gauss rifle couldn't be negated by the clan's advanced systems. 15 points of pinpoint damage was just as deadly to the cockpit of a 3025 Atlas as it was to a clan Timberwolf. It's no wonder that battle mechs started to see refits that included weapons like the Gauss rifle. Some of these mechs, and even new designs, would earn the moniker Clan Buster through a reckoning that clan mech warriors had to face when going up against them. Today's battle mech, the Cerberus, was designed to double up on a good thing and lay waste to any battle mech it encountered. It quickly built a reputation as a mech that could be deadly at all ranges and was in high demand across the inner sphere for many decades. But how did we get there? The Cerberus was dreamed up by the engineers at Lexatech Industries, located on Hun Ho, which is a planet deep in the Draconis Combine. It's a warm and wet planet that is dominated by large jungles and apparently inhospitable to humans because of deadly predator animals. The people that do live there and the heavy industry that they work with is clustered around the North and South Poles. Having run across Hun Ho before, it's one of my favorite Battletech planets because when you check the info, it says the highest native animal life is amphibian. So if everything is true, to have predator animals that are so powerful and dangerous that they've knocked human beings off the top of the food chain except for the North and South Pole, they either imported dangerous animals from elsewhere, which seems unlikely, and released them into the environment, or the native amphibians have evolved into hyper-intelligent killing machines that fear not technology or man. I don't know about you, but I like my deadly amphibian theory. Now, if people clicked on planet lore videos instead of just mech videos, we could learn these interesting things. Alas. When LexTech was ready to go, what they had was a 95-ton Cerberus MRV2 that was designed around a General Motors 380XL engine and Termo Electron 2 Endosteel. Combined with 11 tons of Aldus heavy ferrofibrous armor plating, and it shows that every cutting edge technology was employed to buy just enough tonnage for the mech's weaponry. The XL engine was picked in order to keep the Cerberus mobile enough for its weight, and so it could keep up with and even chase down clan assault mechs. The top speed of 64.8 km per hour is great for a mech of his class. The most notable features of the Cerberus were its dual Grizzard Model 200 Gauss rifles. Taking up most of the critical slots in each arm, these two weapons offered devastating pinpoint damage at incredible distance. If you're going to go big, go big. The rest of the Cerberus's loadout is dedicated to closer range fighting and specifically for clearing away battle armored infantry. The four medium pulse lasers split evenly between the side torsos are good only out to six hexes, but can do a fair six damage with that minus two to hit roll modifier, which is solid. The heat isn't a concern with the 12 double heat sinks. Interestingly, there are two rear facing machine guns, which is a rarity among battle mechs of this time period. Elementals can be scary. Always watch your back. Finally, an anti-missile system located in the head helps keep the mech safer from counterattacking fire support LRM boats that haven't yet been Gauss rifled into submission. It's interesting to note that the four medium pulse lasers are shielded by fire doors which swing closed when they're not in use. For those of you who hate spending your off hours dusting your pulse laser barrels, this mech might be for you. That isn't a euphemism, you're actually... Overall, it's pretty obvious the emphasis of the Cerberus was to create a mech with overwhelming firepower. 
The 11 tons of ferrofibrous armor is a bit on the light end for a 95 ton battle mech, and that is an understatement. The Gladiator, a 95 ton clan mech, which can be expected to run into the Cerberus, has 2.5 tons more armor than its inner sphere opponent. The Kingfisher, a 90 ton clan mech, has 3.5 tons more. I'm not saying it's a flaw in the design because the choice was made to lean more on offense than defense with the Cerberus, however you do need to consider it when you bring the mech into the battlefield. Just to reinforce this point, in one of the first real-world engagements with clan forces, the Cerberuses, or Cerberi, or however you want to pluralize Cerberus, were held back from the front lines until the Novacat forces were pushing hard. At the last minute, the Cerberuses were unleashed, <laughs> I love a pun, and proceeded to cut down the Novacat mechs with deadly Gauss rifle and pulse laser fire. Thankfully, the Draconis Combine was not able to hoard all of the Cerberuses or Cerberi to themselves, and Lexatech was free to sell the mech to anyone with the cash. The Cerberus ended up in all of the major house armies, and even among the smaller states like the Ducky of Endurian. Reports were very positive, and it was clear that the mech was a hit. Mech warriors loved its sloped and sleek armor design, which really set it apart from many of the boxy inner sphere assault mechs. The reinforced torso and legs also made for a steady platform for those Gauss rifles. Though sales were consistent for the Cerberus for years after its introduction, the march of technology has diminished the top tier status of the mech. While Gauss rifles continue to be a popular pick for mechs that need to hit hard, the rise of newer weapon systems has evened the playing field a bit, or at least offered other options. In 3055, roughly a year after the introduction of the original, the Word of Blake Cerberi, Cerberuses, were spotted in field modifications that were notable. Pulling the Gauss Rifle from the right arm and replacing it with an ERPPC reduces the total possible damage at 22 hexes. In exchange, now the mech can remain dangerous on longer battles and campaigns where ammunition for the Gauss Rifles may run low. Two additional medium pulse lasers along with three more double heat sinks makes the spicy, much more energy heavy Cerberus. Finally, three additional tons of armor are added to bulk up the mech and make it much more survivable in a brawling situation. By 3062, everyone was apparently sick of the rear-facing machine guns, so they were yanked for the MR V3 field variant. Imagine being the poor schlub just trying to make a living selling machine gun ammunition. You walk by the mech hangar and see them coldly and callously ripping your money makers out of the back of the mech. Do you have no heart? Where is your empathy? He has three and a quarter children at home to feed. Yeah, anyway. So they pulled the machine guns and spent the two tons on additional armor once again highlighting that consistent issue with the Cerberus needing a little bit more protection from incoming fire. Good times had by all. In 3067, the word of Blake refit with the ERPPC was updated with the MR6B variant. It keeps the Gauss Rifle and ERPPC pairing, four medium pulse lasers, but drops the machine guns in exchange for two ER medium lasers and an improved C3 system. The C3 is neat if you're running a unit with them, but the 15 double heat sinks really aren't enough to be firing all those medium lasers and ERPPC consistently. Like most C3 equipped designs, it ends up being kind of a niche and rarely seen refit. Now with the mech frog variant of the Cerberus, we're going to add a little bit of a backstory. In 3148, in response to calls for a heavy weapons brawling platform, engineers within the Raven Alliance tinkered with a lance of 3050s era Cerberuses. Taking advantage of their access to clan technology, the engine was upgraded to a clan XL to deal with that vulnerability in the original. The Ravens also bulked up the ferrofibrous armor to 16.5 tons and added a couple of extra heat sinks. Wanting to go big but also add some flexibility, the Gauss rifles were pulled from the arms of the Cerberus and replaced with clan LB-20Xs along with 15 standard shots and 20 clustered shots stored in the torsos along with case. While this ammunition will not last an extended battle, the Ravens sought to use the Cerberus MF3 sparingly, at opportune moments when it could be deployed near the enemy lines where it could blast holes and make room for the typically swift and agile mechs from the Raven Tumen. It breaks the mold for Raven designs, and that's a major strength. The enemy won't know what hit it. To supplement the LB-20Xs, the MF3 Cerberus has two clan medium pulse lasers, and for anti-infantry or battle armor work, a clan flamer in the left torso can be an illuminating experience. Finally, the old anti-missile system from the original is swapped with a clan laser anti-missile system in the mech's head. While it is not a min-max design, it does offer some flavor which could provide a unique play experience. Now, of course, you can't put two LB-20Xs on a mech and not test it out in Mega Mech, so we gave it a go. 
dropping with a pair of the MF3s against an Atlas AS7K, a Mahler 1R, and a Valkyrie QD1 just for flavor because it's a QD pie, the battle was on. I forgot to set a map, so it went to a smaller one than I planned, but we just rolled with it. Very quickly, the LB20Xs paid off with a bonus to hit modifier for the scattershot. The Mahler took a brunt of the early game damage and ended up being knocked down first. Princess focused fire on the first Cerberus, except for the Valkyrie who went after the other. Eventually, a good hit with solid shot took down the Valkyrie through the center torso. The Atlas was able to eventually take down one of the Cerberuses, but the second rolled up behind it and cored it out to end the match. With 47.76% of the battle values still on the table, I'd say that's a pretty successful test for the MF3. Overall, the Cerberus is a very fun battle mech and by all accounts an asset to armies that are lucky enough to have one. While the official refits are middling, some of them having a little bit better armor than others, they do at least address the mech's shortcomings. However, if you play smart, use terrain to your advantage, and avoid having to brawl, the original Cerberus can still put a lot of damage on target. This is one of those mechs that I'm really looking forward to seeing in CGL plastic, as the original Rao Partha Pewter, as quirky and fun as it is, really doesn't do a good job of representing this sleek design. So what do you think about the Cerberus? Do you run one in your group? Did you forget that it existed? Do you have a story of it living up to its reputation as a clan buster? Let me know in the comments below and we'll keep the conversation going. Thanks as always for coming by today as we talk Battletech. If you felt it was worthwhile hitting the various buttons, provide some happy brain chemicals for your favorite mechanical frog. Going the extra step to becoming a channel member is even more impactful. You can even come join us on Discord where we talk mechs, painting, video games, and copy-paste memes like they're going out of style. Until we meet again, take care and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.